So this is, the back is steel for the chamber pressure. And the weight of that versus the, like a Bravo is like 24 pounds, and that's like 12, it's half the weight. Hey guys, what's going on? Mike Glover, Philcraft Survival. I'm here with the SIG light machine gun. Man, uh, I just shot this thing for the first time. Uh, if you didn't know, I, I was a pretty big deal <laughs> as a Green Beret. Just kidding, I wasn't, I was nothing. Um, I was a young 18 Bravo, didn't have a lot of talent, didn't have a lot of experience because I was in the old guard. <laughs> um, but I grew up as a saw gunner, doing JRTC and all the things that infantry guys do pre-GWAT, pre-Global on Terror. And so I was very familiar, familiar with the machine gun. I remember in JRTC once, my squad leader, who didn't like me very, uh, very much, put me in front of him and grabbed me as I shot the machine gun standing, doing a raid, and then he pushed me into Constantina wire and walked over my back. That was the infantry back in the days. So you gotta sacrifice your men to uh, win awards. So I, uh, I know machine guns. When I become an 18 Bravo, I was very familiar, and because of my size and weight, most 18 Bravos aren't little dudes for the most part, um, but we become those guys, the saw gunners, the 240 gunners, and this is replacing all of that crap, which is a lot. A 240 Bravo machine gun, which weighs over 24 pounds, made by FN, uh, a saw, a 249, a 556 by 45, uh, Carrying that in a basic combat load is taxing. And the considerations are many because we carry them on trucks, we carry them on tripods, and we carry them uh, in our hands on raids. The requirement for the next generation machine gun was to come up with a solution that kind of addresses all the issues. My favorite part of this machine gun, besides that it's SIG, which stands for quality to me, is it's made in America. It's made in Newington, New Hampshire. If you didn't know it, you should know that SIG just won the contract for the next generation machine gun, which is a 6.8 by 51 millimeter projectile. It's very special because it has a steel casing um, that allows it to withstand the rate of fire that uh, you would see extended or exceeding chamber pressures that would break and fracture most guns. So the Army was very specific. We need these specific requirements met, and SIG stepped up to the plate and they winded up getting it and I was one of the first dudes to actually see this. Um, and I was also one of the first guys to shoot it with uh, some buddies, Kyle Lamb, Jack Carr, which you'll see in the B-roll. But it's insane because you could pick it up. I don't know if you noticed this, but this little guy right here, this isn't a muzzle brake, this is a suppressor. It's a can, reducing the overall uh, gas and um, muzzle flash that you would see on a machine gun. We put a lot of rounds through this thing and I was super impressed by the overall capability. Some highlights, because I, I don't want to go into a nomenclature class, some highlights that impressed me are the ability to flip over the feed tray with the optics still attached. For all my saw gunners and machine gunners out there, you know how much of a pain in the ass that was, especially lifting the feed tray with an optic on it and smashing your hand on a raid in the middle of the night. That's not fun. So it flips to the side, and also uh, has disintegratable links that disintegrate at the bottom and this nice little fancy like magwell setup that puts it where it needs to be versus uh, all over your hands when you're shooting machine gun and it's burning you. We distinguish two things at Fieldcraft, muzzle flip, which is the barrel rising and um, the recoil, which is felt on the shoulder. Those are two significant things that we pay attention to in marksmanship and gunfighting. I don't really remember feeling any of that. Um, I was looking through a holographic site, which is this beautiful optic uh, made by SIG, and what I realized is I stayed on target, especially in my string of fire 
which is full auto. It is uh, semi-automaticable by doing the selector switch all the way to the rear, and you could also shoot it in full auto. Um, it doesn't require, like this is a, uh, just a, a piece to retain it in your shoulder, but it doesn't have a buffer assembly. So there is an empty tube if it's running the tube, or this setup is perfect because it's retractable, and you could pop this off and replace it with different kinds of setups. Um, man, I held this like a carbine and shot it similarly to a gas impingement a 308 gas gun, you know, like a LaRue OBR or a, uh, an SR25, but there was less recoil because it, as, it, as it settles, it's got a system which the engineers, even though I paid them off, wouldn't tell me uh, what the system was, that dissipates recoil inside of the gun. Supposedly, the same felt recoil as an M4, which if you go to a gunfighter carbine course with me, I illustrate that by shooting it single hand with my right thumb on the right side of the grip and I have all the ability to shoot that single-handed because there's not a lot of felt recoil overall. All right, so I'm with uh, St. John who works for SIG and um, I had a lot of respect for, a lot of respect for back in the day, no longer anymore. Yeah, no, um, <laughs> he, he is uh, one of the best shooters in the world and he's also on the engineering team with SIG and help develop this, I'm assuming? Yeah, um, really, I'm on the defense side of the business. So, you know, we're really fortunate at SIG to have so many retired veterans. And, you know, we put that veteran knowledge and know-how into the engineering team and the product development team to give them the gun that we think the soldiers would like. And then we're also fortunate to have a lot of feedback from current soldiers and Marines across the board giving us feedback. We're very receptive, and we do a lot of iterative changes based on what they want for the gun because I don't want to give them what I thought what gun should be five, eight, ten years ago. I want to give them what they think the gun should be for tomorrow. So we talk with the end users of today to give them the gun of tomorrow. So uh, one of the things about St. John is uh, when I had uh, my detachment in 2009, 2010 time frame in the SIF company, we would bring our guys to go train with these guys. And back in the, back in the day when you were looking for experts, you went to Army Marksmanship Unit because these guys were leading the way in developing uh, especially new tactics and techniques in gun handling and efficiency. And to see that translate from active duty into uh, beautiful products like this that are going to change the warfighters' uh, tactics, techniques, and procedure on the battlefield is, is amazing. Um, tell me what were some thoughts, ideas with this, and what was the requirement to, for this machine gun to be built for the Army? Yeah, so the Army had a, a, a tiered list of, I don't want to call it requirements, but wants and asks and they prioritize them tier one, two, and three. Tier were pretty much non-negotiable. Tier two and tier three were wants, desires, and the more tier three requirements you brought into the gun, the li more likely you were to, to succeed, right? Because you're gonna give them everything that they hoped, wished, and dreamed for. Um, so our gun comes in at 12.1 pounds. Um, you can see that it has a fixed stock. You see a lot of our MCX line, you'll see a lot of them have folding butt stocks. This also is able to be equipped with a folding butt stock, but the requirement was so stringent on length of pull and overall length requirements that the quarter inch additional overall length in the hinge prevented us from being able to put the folding hinge on that. So it's a very stringent requirement. Um, we think the Army will eventually go to the folding hinge for a quarter inch trade off. I think that's a good thing. But one of the most unique features about it is at 12.1 pounds, we'll call it a mid caliber light machine gun. So we're shooting 6.8 by 51. We have less recoil than a shoulder fired M4 through our operating system and our uh, recoil reducing buffer in the rear. Why am I getting chills on the back of my neck talking about machine guns? I'm getting excited here. I'm sorry you're so close to me. This is <laughs> awkward. Um, so I, I grew up in the infantry uh, as a machine gunner when we moved in the late 90s from 60s to 240s, and that was an evolution. Mm -hmm. And then we had all the mod packages, the SOP mod packages for the saws. We did the Mark 48. Yep. And what I've noticed about this is it seems to take all of the problems with this wide, you know, wide variety of you got the 240 on the top end, you got the saw on the bottom end, you got the uh, mounts on the, uh, on the trucks, you got the mounts on the ground, and then you got the, the hand held during a raid. This gets rid of all that, so then you could just have this platform to interchange. Is that what it's doing? Is it replacing all that? Um, well, you know, I think everything has a specialty role, and we, took, we tried to look at, you know, I don't want to call problems that the other gun had, but shortcomings that they had. They were developed in the 50s and yeah. 60s and 70s, and of course you can't see into 2020. So we wanted to make sure 
that we utilize modern materials and modern engineering to bring a modern uh, machine gun to the battlefield. So, you know, we talked about 12.1 pounds, reducing the recoil on it. You know, we went to a side opening feed tray because if you have a fr back to front opening feed tray, today, you know, you're fighting with inline, inline thermals, inline IR, they interfere with each other, right? Mm -hmm. So we wanted to rotate that in and out of that relationship and maintain the ability for our inline optics to be mounted on the gun. Um, some additional things that we looked at is, you know, on some of the machine guns, they sear bind. You know, when you aircraft load, you'd have to charge them, but you yeah. have to put it on fire, right? So you're in a helicopter full of guys, you're, you're amped up, you're getting ready to get on the objective, and you got to put your gun on fire, load it, hold the charging handle, put it back on safe and go forward. In so, the middle of the night. And if you don't do that, it'll sear bind and then you have to start the process all over again, mm. right? So you can charge this on safe, you can load it with the bolt forward, just charge it, no safety concerns, no safety issues, don't have to worry about sear bind or anything happening within the operating system. And then, you know, you know what I like to do with the gun is, you know, you can't do that with a machine gun very often, right? Insane. You know, 12 Insane. pounds, it's, it's, it's a great demonstration to take a look at it. And, you know, we wanted to make sure that we gave the soldier who's climbing up a mountain something he can get to the top with and still have the fight left in him. What I've, what I've noticed on the, uh, the open source information that I've read about this in the contract is it's only an Army deal. Currently, yes. How, I, it blows my mind because I, I, I did some research on the 240 uh, just uh, in, in preparation for this and, and reliving some 18 Bravo days where the, the 240 was adopted by the Marine Corps first and foremost because that, you know, you see stuff like that. Yeah. For the Army to come out with this on the top end, look, I was an Army guy, he was an Army guy. Like the Army's not known to innovate the space and the fact they did is amazing, but I'm very surprised the other services haven't picked this up. Is there a reason for that? No, I, you know, I, I think it's an inevitability, mm. you know, and if you look at the MHS program, it was an Army Air Force program and none of the other services had picked up originally either. And then, of course, the Marine Corps and the Navy came right along. So yeah. I think the same path happens with this. You know, the, the, Marine, the Marine Corps is going to have to make a decision, right? So they went away from the 249. They brought in the, uh, the M27. So they went from their squad automatic rifleman into a box fed solution rather than a belt fed solution. So they're probably going to have to have some conversations there. You know, I, you know, I don't want to speak to their TTPs and we, we can both speculate, but it doesn't really get us anywhere. But I think the Marine Corps is going to have to make a decision. I see them at a minimum in the battle rifle in the XM5. And, you know, they'll have to have a, a decision on hard to hard if they want to come back to belt fed. I would, you know, per, for me, I would say it would be best for them to come back from belt fed, but I'm an Army guy. You yeah. Know? And so, you know, we on the defense side, like I said, we're retired veterans, the majority of the team. And when the de decision was made, do we go with a box fed? or a belt fed solution, we were adamant on our side that we didn't want, want to be responsible for pulling the machine gun out of the squad. Uh, and we didn't want to take six of them out of the platoon. Yeah. You know, we, we firmly believe in that fire superiority, the reliability, the durability, and how much of an improvement this is over the 249. Last question about the ammo, because the ammo is very unique. It's a 6.8 by 51, and the requirement was a steel casing, I'm assuming, that had to do with chamber pressures that you would see in extended rates of fire. Um, what are some of the what's some of the reasons for going to the 68 by 51 and how do you see that affecting kind of short and long term the rest of the military with that new ammo in its system? Yeah, so to kind of give you an idea, um, the Army said they wanted a certain performance spec, right? So and the only way you could do it with conventional ammo was to have an extra long barrel. You know, they wanted mm. a velocity spec and with conventional ammo, you need an 18 to 20 inch barrel. Mm. So we were fortunate. The, uh, um, Jason him off on our ammunition team. He was a competitive shooter yep. and you know, he ran into a lot of issues when they try to squeeze an extra 25 feet per second primer failings, right? You've seen it yeah, your entire yeah. career, right? You try to tweak it a little bit and, and, and the case fails. Um, so he had a concept of the two piece at the time was three piece steel base and a, or excuse me, a steel head and a brass case, which fixed the problem of the pressure failings of brass, but still maintained the multiple, you know, 140 years of manufacturing mm -hmm. lessons learned on brass and, yeah. and, and all its tremendous values. And so where a brass case would normally fail at 68 KPSI, give or take a little bit, you know, get beat up here a little bit, like, you know, maybe my cartridge goes to 68.5. Um, our case goes to 120 KPSI. Mm. So we're almost twice as much capable in the pressure realm and we have room to grow. Right now we're running mid seventies mm. with another 45, uh, let's see, let me do my math, another 50 of uh, uh, KPSI to grow. You know, the race of arms and armament over time have always been, I defeat this, this reacts to this, and now we're back to even, right? So we have a, con we have a continuous improvement fire mm. weapon, or a continuous improvement weapon system mm. 
that for the next 30 years as the military is in it can continue to grow and evolve and always provide that overmatch that we're always looking for. Mm. So last, last question. As we see 6-8 evolve in the military, because it seems like the civilian industry and space take a lot of uh, the weapons, the trends, even the marketing from the U.S. military, what does it look like when a 6-8 is kind of trickling down into the civilian firearm space? Does that mean we're going to see 6-8s available in different gas gun setups? I think the most exciting part of this program is the ammunition and what it brings to the future. Because I, tr I truly, within my heart, believe it's the future. I knew it was the future when I saw it, and now it's been validated and, put and chosen by the U.S. Army. So now the rest of industry has to come along. So when we talk about performance with the ammo, that's with conventional powder, conventional primers, conventional projectiles. Nobody on that side has put any R&D uh, dollars into optimizing this system or high pressure, high velocity ammo. So once the powder companies and the primer companies start working on that optimization, I think it changes the face of ammunition like I, I'm thinking in like seven to 10 years, you're not gonna see articles on guns and ammo where it's this new cartridge, this new cartridge two or three times a year. You know, I, I jokingly say that when someone comes out the next hottest 6.5, the 6.5 habanero, right? The hottest 6.5 you've ever seen, right? <laughs> and they say, hey, we're giving an extra 80 feet per second. I take a 6.5 Creedmoor case that's hybrid and I can give you three, 200, 350 feet per second in that case. Mm. No more new rifles, no more new barrels, no more gunsmithing, no more resizing dies. I'm just taking a conventional case, I put the hybrid technology on it, and I'm instantly giving you two to 350 feet per second, depending on the pressure you want to run. Mm. That's exciting, man. I don't get excited about firearms often, but this is pretty exciting. Uh, St. John, I appreciate all your information and appreciate your expertise, and uh, it's good seeing you again after a decade. I didn't That's even right. realize this, <laughs> He was out on the flat range here working the guns. And um, I used to look up to him when I was in the military wanting to be an AMU guy, but I just couldn't shoot good enough. That's just me. Um, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Good you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, guys, so closing this out, uh, we're talking about the light machine gun and all its capability with St. John. Here's something you should uh, understand. As an entrepreneur, somebody who owns a business and employs Americans uh, and, and appreciates employing uh, veterans, this is going to employ nearly 2,000 Americans in, in and around the country based on the ammunition and the requirement of the machine gun. Remember, this is replacing the 249 and the squad, and the spear contract, which we'll talk about in another segment of content, is going to replace the M4. Guys, this is so revolutionary in the overall cycle of military evolution. It's going to change the world. What you're gonna see is you're gonna see, I mean, if you're, you're not doing it now, you should be paying attention to uh, how this unfolds and trickles down to you because the ammo is the biggest consideration and preparedness that we talk about. And if you're on a battlefield where nobody has the round, it's cool to get an AK-47 um, and run around because it's really capable. But if there's ever an issue, are you gonna be able to procure that ammo? So I think, uh, the idea of having this machine gun interoperate with the spear, the 6.8x51, and upping the capability from a 556 by 45 where I've been in gunfights, indirect firing an M4 on bad guys in broad daylight, and going, what the hell is this thing? And now having that capability to reach out and touch bad guys, it's a good feeling to have, especially as somebody who loves this country and loves even more uh, for the men and women who defend it. So that's all she wrote. Appreciate you guys and until next time. Kyle, if you stay right there, we're gonna film uh, we're gonna film two guys, one gun.